Good evening, everybody. I'm Andy Gower, the chairperson of the Conservation Board, and I'd like to call the meeting to order and welcome everybody to our May meeting. So we're going to do something a little different tonight, which is we are going to go through approvable minutes and hopefully approve them very quickly. <laughs> and Cheryl, correct me if I'm wrong, the first group we need to approve is of December 2021. So have we all looked at those? Yes. Okay. Could I have somebody make a motion to approve? So moved. Okay. And a second, please. Okay. Second. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. January of 2022. Are we ready to approve those? Okay. Yep. Do I have a motion to approve them? So moved. Okay. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. The last one. Has everybody looked at February? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve February minutes? So moved. Second. Do I have a second? Okay. Thank you. And all in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. All right. We did it. Okay. First order of business. Surprise Lake Camp. Max, can I turn it over to you to let us know sure. where we're at? Yeah, so can, um, construction has been going on uh, in terms of the stream crossing that we permitted earlier this year. Um, the deer fencing is up on the restoration area uh, that was um, uh, mandated by the town where they did the illegal excavation um, of the woods roads while they were doing the timber harvesting operation. So that's all in place and now installed. Um, beyond that, uh, there's not much more to report. They haven't come back to us yet with phase two of the camp improvement project, but that will be before us, I think, this summer. So that's, that's where we stand right now. And what was the approximate dimensions of the fencing that they undertook versus? They, they accommodated the greater width that we asked okay. them for. Um, so they, they did that and they used the metal T posts. Um, you know, we'll see how, how well that holds up over the years, but I mean, they, they're, the, this board required them to do annual reporting mm -hmm. on the, uh, the uh, regeneration in that area and the, the um, overall, uh, <coughs> you know, overall quality of the fence and making sure that it's still up, you know. Condition. Each, uh, condition. Yeah. Condition. Thank you. All right. So that phase. It, anybody have any comments? It sounds like we're moving forward in a positive How long fashion. Stay up again. Like that long the fence stays up. I think we bound them to five years. So that that's that's at least the reporting requirements based on the minutes in, in prior meetings. Do we have a process for ensuring that they do come before us every year? Is there some sort of a tickler system? Yeah. I mean, we we like Cheryl and I can work to set that up. Um, but I'm, you know, Nick Lissacatos was the one that installed the fencing, and I've been in touch with him pretty frequently, and I've been in touch with the camp pretty frequently. So uh, that's something that I won't take off the, the you know, my, my plate. So we can set up a, uh, a, you know, an annual reminder for us to reach out to them if they're not reaching out to us. But I think it would be great if we had a process for this, because I think you're doing more of this, you know, where we've got, you know, multi-year reporting. Yeah. So anything that makes it easier and more efficient. Yeah, we have talked before, to Cheryl's point, about tickler systems, which I think is hard for the, the town and this board to keep and maintain. I don't know, Cheryl, if there's a way to do it in some sort of permanent town electronic calendar. But we get applicants before the board, and we give the board approves their request but we have reporting requirements and we always worry about the the, the follow-up process since this is a volunteer board and speaking only for myself my memory at, at the best of times was not up to keeping track of things that were personal and professional let alone board related so i think a some sort of organized town tickler system for each of the boards, if other boards have a similar need, would be a terrific thing to do. 
in terms of the ability of the town to follow up and monitor uh, mandatory uh, reporting back requirements. Does the town use Outlook as the system? No. But we have a calendar. Yeah, and Cheryl, Cheryl's engaged me and uh, uh, on that as well. Like, you, that's not something that uh, fell to deaf ears, Jan, for sure. I think she brought that up and has a Google Calendar set up, um, and we just need to formalize that. Well, I, I can say from firsthand experience, my Google Calendar is fabulous as a tickler system for re for recurring events. And we had, if my memory serves me, had asked them to uh, basically provide us with photographic evidence. Yeah, right? annually, and then they were committed to having the campers uh, come and do vegetation monitoring uh, as an educational opportunity, uh, you know, to kind of see how they can, rect you know, rectifying this situation could also provide that educational benefit for the, the campers. Yeah. Okay. And they will be back in front of us too for that second phase of the project, so we can, you guys will obviously be able to engage them. So I think we're on the way to have a good outcome. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Good. Okay, okay so next is, uh, which they're not here, so we'll just really um, discuss this very briefly, which is Stesma and uh, Prins on 15 King Dock Road. Some of us know this is the old banker property. They were proposing to put in a large indoor swimming pool as well as an extension to their house. Um, I believe Max, you were down there independently. I was there with Lou Kingsley. Um, it's very different than what the plans look like. I think what we were very concerned about when we discussed it with them at the last meeting was encroachment for non-essential structures within the wetlands. I only measured, because I had a very long tape measure with me, and Steve Marino, their consultant, helped me, is the closest the pool building would be to the tidal wetland was basically they'd be in encroaching if they didn't move the building uh, 10 feet, so it was 90 feet away. We did not measure, which I don't think is a problem for the pool building, but would be for potentially that extension on the house. There's a stream on the east part of the property. Yeah. Um, but I, but we got, I had forwarded you a letter that Cheryl forwarded to me from the applicants going through our law and this and that, and Max and I discussed it beforehand, coincidentally. I think the biggest issues here are steep slopes, and they're within the uh, uh, Hudson River viewshed overlay. So at this point, I think basically what we need is from, I guess, the town engineer and perhaps the attorney who has jurisdiction on this first time around, because where the pool is being proposed is um, its rock outcroppings, and I think some of it could be Certainly class two, but I believe perhaps class three. So when I was there with the applicants, we looked at what would be another site you could put this. Which there is one site, I believe. Um, for them, it's not preferred because the property consists of three parcels. And I think they don't want to be bound by the fact that they'd have to sell everything together. Um, they felt it was too far a distance from the house. Um, my feeling, and Lou agreed with me, that the issue would be if we were to take this alternate spot, it might be an issue with setbacks, which is a zoning problem. But in terms of being seen from the Hudson River, that would be an issue. Where they actually have placed it is probably minimally invasive in terms of the view shed. So, quite honestly, I don't know where we should go with it, but I think at this point, I think, I think that we need to hear from the town attorney, from the engineer, and I guess our town planners of what's the major issue here. And I think steep slopes versus, and uh, the uh, overlay are first, and then the wet one comes in next. Because the encroachment is not that significant. From the tidal wetland, it is not. What I did not me measure 
is the, because I wasn't focusing on the, you know, there's two additions. One is this big pool, and the other is the, uh, we'll call it a glass atrium and a one bedroom to the house. That, as Max uh, pointed out, might very well be within the stream, you know, less than 100 feet from the stream. It's, I'm just trying to imagine it now, and unfortunately I wasn't focusing because we would have measured it at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the discussion that you and I had was for the applicants to engage the building department and requ request a pre-application meeting so that Ron Gaynor and uh, Steve Gabba could make that determination as to whether or not the steep slopes component of the project would affect the permitting process here. And then if not, um, based on that meeting, then we just evaluate it as, a, as the conservation board. Um, and you know, look at the site and look at what they're proposing and look at what mitigation we'd require. So um, I guess the best way to handle that would be a memo to the applicant regarding you know, that point. Right, right, which I think you and I could put together. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, as I said, when I first saw it on plans, to me it was just, it was almost a no-go. And when I looked at it, it's a bit more possible but again, I don't know how this, particularly the steep slopes falls into it. In terms of the restoration work that was done by the previous owner, um, you know, and overseen by Steve Marino from um, Tim Miller Associates, a little early in the season, but it, it looks very, very good. That's it great looks to hear. really, really good what was done. Um, yeah. I was impressed. I was skeptical. So yeah. it's I mean, good they to still hear that. have some way to go, but it's. It's good. I mean, the only thing I didn't love and the new owner doesn't love is, I guess, in one of the major storms they had in three or four years ago, a huge amount of uh, silt came down that stream slash pipe that has silted in a little bit of the wetland. But if that's the only problem, it's nothing. It looks good. It looks good. So. What about the... Um uh, applicant mentioned that there was some additional brick wall or something like that that they said that we permitted, which we disagreed with. What, what did you see that? I did see the brick wall. I don't think we permitted it. Um, it would that brick wall would most likely disappear if they did the extension, you know, did the the uh, pool house, if you will. Um, I don't believe they built it. I think it was done by the previous owner. So. Uh, you know, I'm open to discussion how we should handle that, but I'm I'm not sure it should necessarily be punitive on the new owner. I mean, we didn't permit it, and I don't know if you know how contemporary it is. It could have been there long-standing. Could have been there for a while, I guess, right? Or did it look new? Well, we would have seen it when we when we, yeah. we, you we walked that oh, many that's times. True, yeah. Remember, yeah. <laughs> it was it was definitely done after. I mean, Max was making regular visits, Mark was making semi regular visits, and occasionally I would go down there. And you know, it was it was done by the previous owner. You know, and obviously without um, a permit. So I, I you know, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure tearing it down does anything for us yeah, no, at this just, point. I was just yeah. curious and you know, wondering what the resolution was. It's just a decorative wall? It's not a... No, it's a little bit of, I would call it a retaining wall. Oh, okay. Right, to give them a little bit more parking, which then begs, well, what happened? It was probably that the site was like this, and they did a little bit of cut so that they had a little bit more parking. So, no, it should not have been done. Yeah, I mean... It, in my opinion, I feel like the, there is an opportunity to re-engage them with more restoration work for that, the tidal marsh there um, in the future. So I think that that should be the focus that the board takes when we're evaluating this when it does come back before us again. And we, and Lou and I did discuss that uh, with the applicant and their consultant, and they seem to be, you know, very willing to do that. So it was... It was more pleasant than I thought it was going to be, so. Well, I, I'll just say as a preface, as I think the board will recall, I've recused myself since the owner and I were uh, partners for, for a number of years. Uh, 
I know from discussions with the owner, the current owner, he is what I would call a serious conservationist. So I would be very hopeful, Andy, to your point, that some remediation, restoration, et cetera, uh, will be very, very forthcoming uh, on their part. And the more minor, which would be a separate uh, permit, is they want to uh, improve the existing dock by adding a floating dock, um, which I think we all agree does not, as long as they get uh, the right permits from the DEC and the Army Corps, is not a big deal. Um, both Lou and I had just suggested if they're going to do that, it might make sense to look at the existing structure because that I don't think anybody has paid attention to the masonry or concrete in 40 years. So. Any other comments, suggestions? Okay. And they'll, they'll be before the board next month? Is that? I'm assuming so, Anderson? yes. Might there be an opportunity for, I mean, do, does it make sense for us, those who have not been down there, to maybe schedule another meeting? I mean, this begs the question of how we schedule these meetings, which we can maybe get to at the end of the meeting. But I don't think it would hurt. Even though we're going to send this to the building department and the town attorney. Um, it's going to come back. Well, not only is it going to come back, I think most of us, other than Scott, know the site very well because it was years. I mean, yeah. my son started a report about it in fourth <laughs> grade and I think gave it up at the end of seventh grade and we weren't done yet. Wow. Um, but I think, it, I, I think it might make sense to to have everybody look at it to see if, you know, I gave you the opinion that Lou and I had and Max had a similar opinion that it's not so much wetland as other issues. Um, but I would encourage everybody to, we'll call it preemptively, look at it. So I don't know if Cheryl will let you lead this if uh, you want to or Do you want to schedule, schedule a site visit or, or, or you, we could, you could wait. Well, why don't we why don't we wait until the end and discuss that and okay. figure out because I think we were thinking about scheduling at tonight's meeting to make sure that everyone's calendars are lined up or at least attempted to yep. do that. Okay. And, and we decided this is a single permit, but we're both in the. No, we didn't decide. We, we didn't that. decide. No, and I, personally, I think it should be two permits. The dock is is very simple and straightforward, yeah, other than requiring right. three agencies are involved. I think you've got two additions. So it would be three permits. It could be three permits. Yeah. yeah, it could be, depending on what the board decides. Absolutely. Okay. Should we move on to new business? Which I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. Uh, Dvorin Farms? Davrin. Davrin, okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you for considering our request. My name is Peter Davrin. Uh, Stacy Farley and I um, run the small farm across the street from Boscobel. It's a six acre tilled farm and um, for growing vegetables. And there's a, there's a stream on the southernmost part of the, fa of the farm that runs east west. It goes into a culvert under Route 9D and then works its way out to Constitution Marsh. It goes all the way up past the, the farm, up under the aqueduct, and then it works its way up to Dale's Pond, which I believe is uh, somewhere on Lane Gate Road. So this is a constant flow of water that, that, that works its way down. In heavy rains and storms, last year, the stream basically jumped the curb, so to speak. It created like a, like a delta, uh, a, a large delta, and then there are a series of, what, what do they call them, rills that work their way out to the culvert. What we would like to do is channel the, uh, the existing, well, the former uh, area, about 30 to 40 feet, and berm both sides in order to keep the stream in its the location that we originally found it and eliminate 
all the other rills that are there um, by excavating uh, down about one foot to two feet and then putting non um, 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 clay or something to that effect, non-pervious material on either side of the, of, the, of the stream so that it stays in place during the next storm. That's what our hope is. And um, I would strongly su suggest, I know that pic picture is not worth a thousand words because you really can't tell from this picture, but that's the delta that was created by the, um, by the, by the storm. And just some small work, hand shoveling, had nothing, no machinery other than to bring the berm material in. Hand shoveling the channel and creating the berm um, would be uh, about 30 to 40 feet and then retain its original condition. And I, I would suggest if you want to review what I want to do, what we want to do, I, we can create a scope of work while we're out in the field. I can reapply for it and then inspect it before we finish. Uh, something to that effect. Anything that uh, works so that we can put it back to its original condition. Yeah, I mean, my only, you know, not to jump ahead of you, Andy, here, but I, I went out and met with one of um, Mr. Davern's staff, and uh, the only reason that I asked him to even go down this road is because it is, the stream is very close to his neighbors, and I wanted to make sure that they had, they had the opportunity before we started just giving permission, because it is an agricultural operation, that they could, they could weigh in if there were any concerns on their part um, before we started making changes. Otherwise, it would be a very simple thing. I don't think this is a major project in any capacity whatsoever. Um, so I know we did receive some comments. Yes. Yeah. Um, we did receive a letter, yes. But it doesn't, seem, it doesn't seem outlandish or like it would, you know, anything that would prevent this from happening. Um, I don't know what the protocol is, but I'd be more than happy to explain yeah. that to our neighbors uh, what, on what we're doing. If they want to come to the farm, I can show it to them, or I can contact them. I mean, this, this was anonymous, though. I don't know whether... Yeah, I don't right. I mean, the gist of the re letter is just essentially residents of Bell Lane have viewed the farm application would like to know what back to the original flow means. They would like to know where the original flow was and where the berm is going to reroute the water to. So are there any historical records that we could refer to that might show that? Well, I think, I think Mr. Davern was referring to that, that, you know, it's a pretty straight course to the culvert of where it used to be. Um, and I think just increased storms and overflow has, you know, in, in more flooding events has increased that span of where you know it would overtop the uh, the channel and then go out towards the neighboring properties and towards your farm fields, so I'm, I'm assuming I'm assuming that that that's you know what they're referring to. So it's really more restricting it to the original flow than actually changing it, redirecting it. No, putting it back to its original flow and location. So, so now it, it doesn't flow in the original location. I'm sorry. It doesn't flow in the original location now. Well, it, it, there is one uh, of the mains, but then there are several others at the same time. It looks like a delta, you know, the, uh, right. so it's, 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 it's about 10 feet wide now, different rills, and I, were trying to consol I was going to consolidate them into the one original stream location that went down to the culvert. And that would just result in, you'd have to just widen it and, and deepen it so that Yeah, you take can the silt and some of the rocks out, uh, uh, berm the two sides so that it doesn't create the delta and then let it flow. And probably have to maintain it um, over, over the course of time to keep the original intent of the location. You think that'll, that'll solve the volume issue? Yeah, I, I, I do, I do. Uh, uh, the berm should be maybe 18 inches high or something like that, and there could be a planting on it, which is what we did up at where our barn is. We put a berm uh, along the stream and then planted vinca, I think it was, and uh, that seemed to work. You so mentioned clay. Is clay a good idea, Max? <laughs> I mean, I would, I, I would defer to you. I was I mean, only <laughs> thinking of something non-pervious, you yeah. know, so it's it, um, uh, it, not, not 
it's organic. It, it would be an organic material, but it had it would have clay in it, so that could compound, so it could basically stay in place. I, mean, I was that, just thinking of that. You know, the lake that uh, the cloud lake would have that clay that clay layer that was causing all the issues. That's different. Yeah, well, I mean, you, I don't think you could use bentonite there yeah. because the way bentonite works was act, which is actually a you know a good material, but it needs to stay wet. Once it, it's almost like canvas. Canvas is not waterproof till it gets wet, and then it is. It expands. Um, my only question is: there's a nice small woodland swamp there. Um, how is it going to affect feeding into that? Because when you know, best practices on the whole um, don't always call for channelizing because then you increase velocity. So how are you overcoming? Then that? I won't channel it. I'll just berm it and leave it the way it is and not not dig down from the existing condition. Just berm the two sides. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think, uh, for my, in my opinion, it was really my concern with giving the permission just to do this before bringing it to the board because I wanted the neighbors to weigh in. And I feel like the letter that they, they wrote essentially doesn't want the stream to be pushed towards their properties. That would be my assumption. That's, that's, what it, that's the flavor that I got yeah. from, from it as yeah. well. So there's, the, ju there's just a concern that it yeah. may wind up getting. The stream ran like this. It's now running like this. I just want to bring it back to this. And I would do that with material that would just burn by either side so it has this flow and it, um, it's high enough so it doesn't jump the berm again during a storm. And they, uh, they don't have to channel it. But and it's, it's not going to go on to anybody's property on Bell Lane? No. I mean, I think that's where the concern was. So. No, it's on Boscobel property now, my landlord, and it's... Uh, and uh, it's, it stays on our property, but I think what happened when, when their storm hit last year, it did kind of work its way onto the neighbor's property. And then it slowed down because there was a, quite a head of water. And it slowed down, and now it's many, many rills into the culvert. Okay. Yeah, I just, the, the only thing I just want to avoid is obviously more velocity than needed and not starving the. Uh, Small swamp, wooded swamp that's sure. there. Yeah. The, the swamp where? That. Down below? Yeah. Oh, I, okay. Well, it's quite a head of water constantly, so okay. I think that's water from Dale's Pond and the aqueduct. I believe so that the this, aqueduct I mean, is I, leaking you know, out. I had looked as best as I could at the site just to look without a map, you know, using your photograph, and I'm assuming what I'm seeing here is 9D. Yes. That's 9D, yes. Right. So this is the bottom. Yes. Right, which is right adjacent to the adjacent or through the swamp. It forks. It forks to the that the road that connects towards um, the old plum bush. Mm -hmm. And then there's the culvert. The culvert where that stream goes through, it goes west, right towards the Hudson. Correct. Right. So if it does make the water does make its way to the north there, it's probably more minimal than where we headed to the west. Well, right now, that channel that runs parallel to 90, is that the channel you're thinking of that's wet, that runs parallel to 90? That flows into the culvert also. Okay. I so mean, if you're, if, if you're willing to work with, I don't know how you, the board feels about this, but if willing to work with me to come up with a plan. Sure. Um, once it's, you know, the berm, the, we get the dimensions of the berm and sure. figuring out plantings, maybe between the neighbor pro neighboring properties and your property. Um, I think that's what to do. Yeah. Okay. So we can coordinate something where you come out and we take a look at it and then I'll reapply or any, any way you want to do it. Yeah. No, I don't think it would be a reapplication. We would just, uh, okay. we'll maybe come up with a new narrative and then that could be submitted with the application. Yeah. No calculations or engineering plans or anything like that. If this is more of an empirical, you know, type of solution. Yeah, I mean, we're in a little bit of a gray area here. It's an agricultural operation. We have agricultural exemptions in uh, Chapter 93. That's true. Um, so, honestly, this is 
in my opinion, a good faith effort to come in here. I just wanted to ensure that we weren't going to be causing distress on the neighbors mm -hmm. by any operation here. I don't think it's uh, you know I don't think it's changing the the nature of the area based on what he wants to do. Um, and just just you know and trying to stick with with the the, the code. Is everybody I'm comfortable? comfortable? With that. So yeah. may I contact you directly through the town and and schedule something so we can yeah. just agree on a scope and then we'll do the work yeah. and then inspect it and we'll yeah. be good to go. So if everybody's comfortable. Okay. I am. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, next, Manitoba. Would you like it? You can sure. Good evening. Uh, I am Ruth Parnell. I am, I have been um, curator of Russell Wright's landscape at Manitoga for over 20 years. And I'm a landscape architect emerita from Western Massachusetts and formerly also registered in New York State. And was also, have also been the chair of the Conservation Commission in my own hometown in Massachusetts. Emily Phillips is has worked for Manitoga for 11 years. First, uh, a part-time volunteer, then an intern, and now, to my great relief, she is a full-time, um, correct title, landscape collection and conservation manager. And we have, have do they have the handouts? We have some extra new things for you to add to your homework. You want to pass them out now? Because I'll refer to them. Oh, sure. Thank you. I hope this is better. Okay. Uh, I request that, that you hold some questions. There will probably be some as I talk, but I need to get through this in order to keep okay. all these complicated pieces together uh, so that they make sense. Uh, we brought to you a request for a permit uh, to, for the repair and reconstruction of a major design feature in Russell Wright's landscape the Quarry Pool Waterfall. Now, probably more than one of you is familiar with Manitoga's property. Is there anyone who has never been there or doesn't know anything about it? Well, that will help your understanding of this problem because you've probably been on the tour path and this is one of the main features of the tour path. Uh, the entire 75 acre property was disturbed by the quarrying by King's Quarry in 1910 and more or less left in place a jumble of rocks and no hardly any trees except in places where they couldn't do the quarrying and Russell the waterfall <coughs> was enhanced by Russell Wright in uh, the 1950s, before any wetland regulations, I presume, um, and when he built his remarkable house. Um, he reassembled the quarry remnants uh, into a series of boulders and cascades and pools down a drop to the quarry pond. And, and to do that, he mortared boulders in place um, to protect the sidewalls. And the increasingly severe and frequent storms um, uh, and <coughs> the increasing 
development of the adjacent properties, all of which drain onto our land from all sides, uh, have contributed to flow that have greatly altered um, the, uh, um, Russell's construction. And it now threatens the last line of defense against bank erosion and serious disruption of a bridge and a major path, the one on the tour path. <clears throat> now this might not matter if Manitoba was a natural area, but it, we could just let it go and uh, you, you know, pop, have, let the storms pop the boulders out and have the whole sidewalls collapse. But it is not a natural area. It is, uh, in Russell's own words, a garden of woodland paths. The whole property, as you've probably heard the spiel if you've been on the tour. And uh, it's also a national historic landmark, which is one, and is one of the very few in the whole nation that includes both the, the house and its landscape because they have acknowledged that um, Russell's design features are important to this uh, classification. And so our duty, those of us who work for Manitoga, uh, our duty to this designation is to steward Russell's design features as best we can. And that's why we want to see what we can do to reconstruct the damage to the waterfall because we have a looming emergency. And a, ge a fluvial geomorphologist whom we consulted uh, told us this. He said, uh, he emphasized, oh, and you have a summary of his comments in the packet that Emily just handed out. Um, his name's gone right out of my head, but anyway, he's... Douglas Thompson. Doug, yeah, Doug Thompson. He, was a, he is a well-known nationally uh, professor at Connecticut College. Uh, and, and he said that we really only had a few years to do what had to be done to stop this, the last remaining boulders from being eroded in the big storms that are coming. Um, and, and if those, if we lost those, the er erosion wouldn't stop because it's unconsolidated glacial uh, till, I guess he called it, uh, in the site. There's no angle of repose, in other words. It, it's not gonna stop eroding at a certain point. It'll just keep going and have flatter and flatter banks, which means the stream, uh, it all gets wider. And, and it would keep going until it's about oh, 50 feet uh, upstream of what's now the bridge that's there, which means the bridge would be gone. The, uh, well, we'd have to make it much longer. So Emily and I considered four possible stone specialist for the job. This is a very unique job. It's a combination of difficult physical characteristics and significant design characteristics. Um, and we were fortunate enough and our board agreed there. We've kept them informed right along of what's, what this um, project has to be, and <clears throat> we were able to get into the 2022 schedule of Peter Jensen and Associates. Now, if any of you are doing park work, any kind of trail building, you may know about Peter Jensen. He, he's been working in this field for about 45 years, and now he, um, he works with about four other uh, professional trail designers and stone workers. 
um, rock, yeah, trail and rock work throughout the New England and the Middle Atlantic states. Uh, Peter also tra has trained other trail builders and rock workers, including the Jolly Rovers, whom you may know uh, more directly from around here. So we are presenting to you Peter's suggestions, and most of what you have in your packet is almost in his own words, both the new packet and the other one that was um, probably that you had earlier, the bigger sheets of paper. Uh, we're now in the design, <coughs> excuse me, the design and layout phase. Uh, the next step will start in November this year uh, after our tour season has ended. Uh, that's very important. It's not that he's going to, the work is going to disrupt the, um, the bridge in any way, but there'll be storage of stone, fill materials in the parking lot and other things like that. So we've asked that he, and as a matter of fact, he was busy up until then, so it worked out very conveniently for us. Um, and then he, pardon? And low flow. And low flow, yes. That's a probable, well, who can tell? I mean, last year there was water in that stream um, more than I'd ever seen over the 20 years, uh, consistently in the stream over the 20 years I've been there. So who knows what it's really going to be. And um, the plans are that uh, he may have to uh, install some diversion, and that'll, that's in your description too, or may have to postpone, rearrange schedule, that sort of thing. And uh, <coughs> the first thing he's going to do is um, the siltation barriers as we required by this board and um, anything like that and woven geotextile um, in the stone fill areas uh, and we do we have we can talk more about that if you want to um, and then after that salvage of boulders and installation will follow. Now salvage of boulders means Peter and his partners and their equipment, and there is a, what are we calling it, a derrick that you'll have, you have a picture of in your packet. And actually there is a picture in the first group of pages you have, there's a picture with the derrick, but also in the newest handout, there's a charming picture of some unidentified friends of Russell's with their Derek doing exactly the same thing that Peter, Derek kind of ha brings up scary pictures, but it's really an assembly of big pieces of wood that are levers, I'm sure. And he's also using, he uses winches and cables uh, for lifting and sliding and resetting the tumbled boulders which have come down from closer to the bridge and to the lower parts of the stream before they even enter the quarry pool. And he's going to pluck those up the slope and put them back in place. Um, and <clears throat> if there's a little cross section in that new packet that you have, <clears throat> excuse me, it has some color in it. And the First, he'll be pinning, pinning boulders. He's going to use stainless steel rods and epoxy drilling into the ledge, but that's all the disturbance of the ledge that there will be to hold the bigger boulders in place and then drill through some smaller boulders in front of those to hold them in place and then backfill with a layer of crushed stone inch and a half did you say inch and, a half inch and, and so it can be compacted and it, it will hold in place but let water flow through to some extent but and then he's going to make lifts there are at least three lifts of crushed stone to bring the grade 
for about 18 feet out from the bridge back to its original grade. And you'll see that illustrated on the little colored um, cross section, the lines that are the original um, level of the stream and, and the existing level. Um, and so the, he'll backfill with crushed stone, do more layers of boulders that are pinned in and backfill those to simulate that original higher stream bed. And I'd say that Peter is not only part Egyptian engineer, uh, but he also has a Japanese stonemason's eye for uh, the appropriateness and appreciation and of Russell Wright's design. And so there's another picture. The label on the photo in your new packet says something like um, the view from the bridge upstream. And that's a picture of what the original undisturbed stream bed looks like. And that's what Russell was trying to replicate and also what Peter will be aiming for. And then after that, the work will focus on moving the stones. It'll, it'll, that'll be done for the upstream section, well, upstream, downstream of the bridge, but the first section will be finished and he'll move down the stream toward the quarry and, and reassemble the stones that have fallen, uh, that are left that he has not used already, and uh, reconstruct the pools and cascades. And there's no bank erosion work involved in that second section. Um, and finally, there will be a cleanup, which, uh, you know, erosion control in place probably throughout the winter, assuming, as we wish, that he can do, he said it's, he thought it would be about a one month job. Um, and he'll remove the unused crushed stone, which by the way is, it will be stored in the parking lot, which is outside of the buffer zone. Although the path to the bridge, uh, which, which is how the stone will be delivered with this little um, motorized wheelbarrow this is all very low-key work, really. Um, anyway, um, and, and we can do erosion controls along that path, too. Uh, and the outcome, we hope, is minimum construction disturbance visible by the next tour season. So with that background, um, do you have questions? A lot of details are in your homework. So. Max, you want to sure. start? <laughs> sure. Um, I, just quickly, uh, could you update us on where you are with the DEC in the process here, too? Or uh, yeah. have, they been, have they been given this whole? Uh, um, they've been given um, some to look at and advise us. Over here, to the oh. microphone. And, um, but I was waiting to hear maybe um, some more recommendations for how we can, uh, you know, some uh, maybe erosion controls, things like that about during water and how, if you all had some, uh, with this permit, we could use that for our DC permit, but we've had conversations about it and I plan to do that very soon. The construction timeline, you want to start, in the best case scenario, you'd start in November? Yeah. Okay. So I think, would you like the board, you're, you want the board to take this as an initial, the initial look at this application and then provide feedback and comments and potent, maybe we can schedule a site visit um, and kind of take it from there, knowing that this might be a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a back and forth process, you know, to make sure that we're hitting all the marks here? Yes, and we want to hit all the marks. We want to do it correctly. Um, we want it to last. We want it to, um, we, um, 
we don't want to get it out of hand economically. <laughs> and also, um, uh, Peter Jensen is working now. He's already started his schedule, so he's not avail as available to do a lot of the design work now, so that's why he's put a lot of time in um, up to now, so that's really also why we're submitting now. Um, so we could uh, get more of his input, but it, we'd really have to schedule that. Might have to have like a Zoom call or something like that. Sure. It would be hard for us to get him here throughout the summer, but um, yeah, I think we would like to I don't want to speak too much for the board, but a, a major a major thing that you should really think about highlighting is all of the environmental protection measures that you're going to be putting in place. I know that you mentioned some in the overall narrative that you described, but those are those are things that we think about um, in terms of impacts during construction or impacts overall. Um, the other thing that just came to mind, you know, that really was kind of like a something that that stood out to me, I guess, when I was hearing this, is a lot of a lot of material being brought in, in addition to repinning rocks. So that could be clarified a little bit more, but uh, you know, I would turn it over to the board. Since, since this is on the historic uh, landmark register, is there some additional historic review that has to take place? Because uh, I know on Old Albany Post Road, when know, the that, town did some work, they, there was, so. It, we can look into that. Unless uh, there's a, because I'm on the board of directors of the Old Road Society, unless there's something like New York City has a historic landmark commission, if there isn't, um, it's sort of up to the applicant to do the right thing. Okay. I do, I worked uh, years ago on the replacement of one of Russell's original bridge, just a wooden plank bridge with a railing on it. And the um, officer from the state historic preservation, which had, I think, some stake in the funding of it. I'm not positive, but anyway, she said, well, it, it, because I was worried it wouldn't meet code, current building code standards. And she said that just do do the best you can make sure people are safe and respect Russell's design was what she recommended that it didn't have to be the typical you know four inch welded wire fence kind of thing filling in the cracks so that it was a combination of current standards and the protection of the design I mean, I, would, I think the board would really benefit from hearing from um, the, your, your uh, consultant, too, if, he, if it's possible, just to talk through some of his, his thoughts on the uh, construction phasing and all that. that would, I think that would weigh, you know, help, help our board out substantially. It, it is his time is very difficult oh. to schedule. But. Uh, Peter Jensen or Doug Thompson? Whoever is providing you the most like technical expertise, yeah, you know, that's Peter. That's right. Peter. So it, it, it uh, we'll check with him and see that the, the difficulty might be getting him, first of all, to a place where he can and a, a location where he can get um, internet because he's often in deep woods doing these things, and and secondly a time when it's convenient for both him and the board to meet but we can check with him is there is is there a pretty rigid uh schedule as far as you people are concerned to coming to something like a zoom meeting with him or could you do can that call, cheryl can he call in to these meetings yeah he's call in or we could set up a zoom for another meeting he, he might not be able to make it on a particular Tuesday night, for instance. So, uh, it, is, is there room for something like everybody working a Zoom meeting from home, or? Yeah, we might have to have a special meeting. Yeah, we could do that. I mean, just like a site visit, but. Right. Right. Manitoga, Manitoga is an important enough cultural treasure for this community that I think the board would want to try and accommodate 
Mr. Jensen. Well, that's very kind of you. It's, uh, we can get some ideas from him, a general idea of what he might be able to manage. He lives in Vermont, but he travels all over the, the East Coast. So, um, and right now is a building season. So we'll check with him and bring that back to you as far as a Zoom call some way or another, maybe. Yeah, I mean, the first place to start would just be to, you can propose the second, the second Tuesday of the month. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes he, he has visited Manitoba a couple times now. He has a teaching gig in Pennsylvania. Okay. And coming back and forth, he stopped in between. It's not always a Tuesday, but, but we can try. Well, yeah, I mean, the fact that you're coming here now and your, your ideal construction timeline is November, I yeah. think that that's really good. So. Yeah. <laughs> you know, couldn't we, if he's going to be in town, maybe we could just meet him at Manitoga. Yeah, yeah that would be awesome, too. Yeah. If it's a, if it's a okay. site visit, it's a site visit. If it's a Zoom meeting, then I think we need to set it up as a special meeting. Right. It does and it to needs up. to be, you know, we need to communicate to the public that we're having a special meeting. Yeah, yeah, so. In the context of a site visit, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other comments or questions from the board? Do we It'd be good to see it and also yeah, hear I, from the, the, the person who's going to be doing the work. That would right, be great. I, I, I think I took a look at it briefly yesterday. Um, I do think it's worth looking at. I think one of the other questions that does the board needs to think about, and I don't have a yes or no, it is a relatively major project within a water course. It's also very difficult, and what they're planning to do, I think, is commendable using derricks and very little machinery. But the question is, should plans exist that are done by a licensed professional, be it a, whether it's an engineer or a um, landscape architect that's licensed in the state of New York? I do think, and I think we're not going to be able to decide that until everybody looks at it. Yeah. I could make one comment to that, if it's all right. Uh, Peter agreed to do this work only on the basis of time and materials because it's very unique and also the costs of materials are varying so tremendously these days but it's uh, it's kind of like a design build project I, if you've ever worked with a structure a designer for structures an architect on a design build basis. It's the general idea, fairly specific is, though, is, is laid out, but that person is doing the building too. So when there are surprises that come up, as in a demolition, you know, you don't know what you're gonna find under the demolition. In this case, it would be very hard to know before those boulders are picked up and evaluated and moved, it would be hard to have a drawing, an engineer say, okay, this boulder needs to go over here, and this boulder over here, and the other one over there, because that's what a, an engineer drawing would have to have. That I don't think is what we're looking at. Oh, okay. Okay, it's, it's more in essence an engineer or a landscape architect overseeing it to make sure that all protections are in place. I think we all understand that it's somewhat of a work in progress and yeah. it's more, lack of a better term for it, uh, often an architect will hire a stonemason because they want a stone facade. It's often going to be the stonemason's artistry yes. that is going to finish. I think we all understand it that. I think it's, it's we just want to make sure that the stream and the water quality is protected okay. and I think it's something that once we all see it we'll be able to make a determination of what we feel we're most comfortable with in terms of that we don't I I was not suggesting we need plans where each and every boulder are going okay the um, just so that you know Emily's position is going to be dedicated during the construction to being the on-site representative for the organization. Um, so she'll know what has been approved and what has to be done. Uh, we 
we'll have to see so, sort of a project, not a project manager exactly, but a site observation kind of position is what you're talking about. You're That's what landscape architects a basic would call plan, it. plan, right? That they can follow. A rough plan yeah. that would be followed. So we would have a plan that would be existing conditions, right? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, many engineers would be comfortable with a relatively simple plan with photographic evidence that okay. they've put together. I, I, and then basically overseeing, you know, what's the narrative for water protection? silt protection mm -hmm. and then signing off that everything has been done properly it protects the town okay there there's a quite a bit of that kind of information that's all that's in the packets that you have the pictures there's one plan view there's several details uh, which are things that well the details anyway what Peter provided in the larger yes those larger drawings. I, I so. absolutely understand that. What I, the board will have to make a decision okay. after seeing it of whether this is enough, because usually in a project of this scope, it would be overseen and the narrative and certain plans of varying detail, doesn't have to necessarily be insane, would be done by a licensed professional. And in this case, it would normally be either a civil engineer or a landscape architect. Okay. Is, are, are you saying then that that's a requirement you're imposing at sure. right now? I think now? at this point, I think we should look. After I think the that, site visit? I think we need to have a site visit and okay. then that's we the can decide. That's the next step. Yep. Next step is a site visit and then also maybe planning that, that meeting or site visit with Peter when he is available. Yeah, I think that's the, I think that's the, the point we're trying to convey is that the, the, the level of detail in the plans that was submitted is, is, a, is the first step. We need a little bit more. And if you look at comparable projects, um, I don't know if there's a precedent in the town quite like this, but when we look at a little bit more well-depicted drawings with the design professional kind of overseeing it in terms of, you know, just a little bit more detail, I, I would say. I think there's some, there's definitely pages within this that start striking at that mm -hmm. sentiment. Okay, well, I think between what you have in hand and a site visit, um, you'll, you'll be able to define what it is that uh, you think is required. Yeah, and I think the, the meeting with... Um, and meeting with yeah, Peter. Yeah, I think yeah. that'll be helpful. Maybe we can talk to him and convey to him what, what would be... <laughs> okay. You know. The good news is we've got some time since you're, you know, you're planning on starting in November. Right. So we've got some time to put all these things in place. So. One, I hope. Yes. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't, you know, linger. Sure. Uh, I, I think I think also to that point we're sensitive to the fact that you're a nonprofit. He's working on a time and materials basis. Um, like most nonprofits, every dollar matters. And in this case, time matters. At the same time, we have responsibilities that we have to meet. But I think we want to try and work as cooperatively as we can with Manitoba, because the work obviously has to be done. OK. Should we try to get uh, Peter's uh, visit with a site visit? or you think two meetings I mean, would be better? That's, that's the ideal. That, the ideal. that yeah, is the that ideal. That sounds ideal to me, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, It'd be easier, too. Yeah. So we'll work, well, yeah. we'll work on that. We'll okay. get him a plane ticket. <laughs> I know we were talking earlier about setting the site visits this meeting, but that might be a special, yeah, special case. Special. So yeah. we'll have to coordinate with Cheryl okay. and the board to figure that one out once yes. you understand his schedule. Okay, maybe that's what I'll do first thing, pin him down and then call you and... I'm sure this site has been well documented with, you know, photographic, you know, pictures over the years and all. Have you done a survey of, like, historical pictures, you know, that, that are available to, we, to kind of reposition the boulders in the original positions? We have quite a few. There's, there's one we actually did with um, Doug Thompson where we actually numbered and we, and uh, Peter is also numbered. Uh, some of the boulders that we see 
and where they where they were. Uh -huh. But um, there's a lot of concrete as well that's c come down. The chunks of concrete that um, will have to be moved. And but he, when Peter was doing his calculations for the the crushed stone fill, he calculated by measuring a, um, a number of those over five foot diameter boulders that are down and sort of calculated as that. And I think he might have over calculated how much crushed stone he's really going to need, but um, he did. That, that calculation is somewhere in the yeah. handouts, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it did say yeah. how much. But on the application also, it said how much soil is going to be disturbed. And um, I, don't, um, I don't understand that quite, because <laughs> we don't think there's going to be, um, I did not understand, because we're not going to be removing any We're not going to be excavating any, the excavating banks. Any we're going banks. to be armoring the banks, but not like a highway uh, drain, drainway kind of riprap. That's what the crushed stone is for, small size and big boulders. Yeah. And original appearance. Okay, so we got a plan. Yes. Okay. Great, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming in. Okay. Next is. Uh, I have a question for the, for the board, it's, and I'm sorry, but it's a process question. So, is the, is the letter from the DEC how we deal with um, projects that have um, species of concern? In this, this particular stream is a stream that DEC also regulates. So in situations where there's dual jurisdiction, we require the applicants to also engage those other parties. Um, so ultimately, once we provide our feedback, they can go to the DEC with their, their permit application and say that the town is satisfied with this, uh, the materials provided. They, the DEC, then might po impose even more restrictions. But in this case, so, so the, there's already a, a letter from the DEC. They've engaged the DEC, but have not gotten any materials no, back no, yet. That yeah. was just a little preliminary. They advised me that they wouldn't, uh, there is a threatened species, a couple of three, actually. Um, and, and the um, stream is also that to them, and they gave me feedback on it. So I just don't think it's Okay. And better. But that's not the <clears throat> they haven't received our whole application and given us any. Right. Well, I was just dealing with this one particular question of the, the, the three sensitive species. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, I think jurisdiction will be held ultimately because this is a, a regulated stream. Um, I don't believe the work they're proposing will impact the, the species of concern, but the regulated stream is ultimately where they would be <coughs> providing them a permit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, in the end. And Max, what is the date by which we need to approve this in order to give the DEC time to approve it in order to allow construction to begin by November? Uh, at the latest three months beforehand. So, so yeah, end of August. And when in November do you contemplate? The second week in November. So we have to approve this by the second week of August. Sure. Yes, but I, um, the regulations for this particular stream, I believe it's a trout. Uh, it's classified as a trout stream or as a trout modifier. So they already are doing the right thing by by waiting until yep. this time of year. So that that's in your favor too. But yes, you're correct, Jen. But getting it into by, by August, I think, would be good. Well, I can go ahead and apply to them now. I also have to apply to the U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Also, an okay. application in that. Okay. So I'm going uh, probably to proceed with that now. Yeah, do it. yeah. I would do it, it concurrently. Be, it should yeah. be done. I mean, yeah. the Army Corps is probably going to be really not much of a brainer, no brainer. Yeah. Because it's just you have to apply because you're flowing into the Hudson, a tidal body. Yep. 
Yes. I mean, yep. And they do that. Yeah. <laughs> and their only concern is the stream order, which is where we are. Maybe. Yep. Great. Thank you. Okay. Is there somebody here from Glenwood Farm? Hi. Good evening. So my name is Eddie Walsh. I'm a I'm a trail consultant working for Glenwood Farm. Um, so the project that is proposed and uh, applied for here is a um, a walking trail, a five foot wide walking trail that. Is, is, is everyone here familiar with Glenwood Farm? Yeah. Um, yes, yes, okay. So the trail will connect the boathouse, which is on Perkins Lake. Perkins Lake is a dam section of the Clove Creek. Um, and uh, connect from the boathouse up to the Perkins house, which is the house above the CSA fields, the farm fields up there. Um, the purpose of the trail is to get guests who are who are at, at events up at the, the Perkins house down to the boathouse and vice versa. Right now, the only way to do that is to walk on the road, on Glenwood Road to get down there. It's a hot, sunny route and, the, and this is a, a really attractive section of forest to, um, to, to make that journey through. Um, so the trail is 1,800 linear feet. Um, the majority of it is an uplands um, and that is on, on a relatively steep slope outside of the controlled area. Um, the construction in that section, again, it's out of the controlled area, but it's gonna involve pretty typical um, trail construction techniques, um, a full bench cut across the hillside at five feet, and then uh, a, few, a few steps and one steeper section. Within the controlled area, um, it's relatively flat terrain and um, overgrown farm fields, essentially, and um, kind of boulder strewn in some areas, but um, the the, the plan there is to build an accessible sec trail from the boathouse to um, a small stream. The stream is not a regulated stream um, per New York State. It does run year round. Um, and um, there's the, uh, so that's, that, that section of trail, which is um, about 600 linear feet, um, will have a five foot wide crushed stone surface set on top of a, um, uh, a non-woven geotextile. Um, and there are, um, along that stretch, there will be two culverts installed to, um, where, where there's small, very, very seasonal rivulets. And I've been out there for about a year now, and it wasn't until this past, um, past few weeks that I noticed that there was a bit of, um, a, a small channel and, and very high water events, uh, to, to, to take that water. Um, I'm trying to think what other details. So there are, there, there will be no disturbance directly to, the, the water course of this small stream or to the, um, the high water mark, um, below the high water mark of the, of the lake itself. The only connection with the lake is, uh, is a series of steps that goes down to the boathouse. Um, so it's kind of an alternate ending. There'll be an accessible route that goes around to the front of the boathouse um, near where the, the, the driveway comes down to the boathouse, but then there'll be some steps to take folks directly down to the, to the boathouse. Um, uh, we, we will put um, either silt socks, silt fencing, or coral logs in places where there is a risk through the construction activities to, um, for, the, for either the excavation to, um, to, 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 in a high water event to, to flow off um, or um, uh, post-construction as well. Um, so you know, we do, um, our firm is a design build, build firm, so we will also be doing the work. We do, we've done a lot of work in the town of Phillipstown over the years, but it's all been on state property. So, so I've never been to this, uh, this group here before, but, um, but we'll be using the same techniques that we've been, we just finished a large project in Vonstock State Park, a, a nine mile trail system. Um, so, you know, and we're, um, we're under close eyes there as well. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other details here. So, you know, roughly the excavation, as I think I, I think I noted, it's about um, 60, I've estimated roughly 60 cubic yards of excavation linearly through the um, controlled area. And again, that's a five foot wide width, um, about a half a foot deep um, of, of basically, and that, that really is the ex quote excavation involves grubbing up the, 
the, the mostly invasive um, species in the trail tread corridor. So there's a lot of um, Japanese barberry and multiflora rose in the, in the area of the controlled area that we'd have to, we'd have to remove that and, and cause disturbance for that. So I use the, ex the term excavation lightly. It's more of a grubbing process. Um, and then the, uh, uh, the fill that's going into the controlled area is that crushed stone um, we use a half inch minus product, which works well for accessibility, but also compacts well, so it would be a compacted surface in the end. It would either be crowned or have an outslope, so water can shed off, shed off the surface. Um, yeah. And then the, bridge, the, the small stream is crossed with a, a 20 foot uh, bridge span that will, the, the actual water channel is only about 12 feet there, but we know again we're going to do no disturbance to the banks or the bed of the stream there. Um, in a nutshell, any questions? Max, you want to begin? Um, no, just the back, background on the board. Eddie and I went out there and, and walked the rough, uh, the rough extent of the trail up to about where the um, northeasternmost uh, wetland buffer from the stream or the watercourse buffer from the stream terminates. Um, I can second the fact that most of what's in the buffer is a Barbary understory. <laughs> um, but I honestly think if the board has any reservations about permitting this project, there could be a really good opportunity for restoration work in there as mitigation. Um, maybe not by your firm, but for Glenwood to retain somebody to do an extensive, extensive restoration you know, plan, um, maybe within whatever the board uh, would feel would, would uh, mitigate this, this level of impact. Um, and do some native plantings there um, to allow for the work. But uh, you know, f first things first, I would recommend getting having the board get out there and taking a look. But yeah, that's yeah, my initial impression. Well, okay. I was going to say again, this is a agricultural operation, right? So. Sure. Yeah, I. Uh, it doesn't fall under that though, because it's it's not protecting. In agricultural, this is other work. Yeah, that would be kind of a. I would say that would be a harder stretch okay. to. Yeah. You know, if they were, if this was, you know, work that was protecting Understood. a field. Yeah. 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 Okay. Or they needed to get access to the stream to pump water to yeah. irrigate. Okay. It's different. So comments, questions, anybody? Yeah. I think I have. My suggestion is we look at it. I mean, I, I'm guessing other than the stream crossing itself and maybe even the stream crossing is nothing with nothing, um, that it doesn't necessarily require engineer or landscape architect's plans. Um, I thought I read something, though, in the packet, and maybe I'm wrong. There was something about a culvert being placed. Yeah, so I'm um, on the approach. Well, so with a crushed stone trail surface, just like a crushed stone driveway, mm -hmm. right, it's much more susceptible to erosion, even small water flows, than most native soils, um, so even after it's been compacted. So um, we identified two places where um, there is a seasonal, when I say seasonal, maybe like once a year flow, but it would be enough to disturb and wash away some of the crushed stone surface. And then that could potentially, without that culvert there, that could potentially flow um, Put, move some of the, the fines from the crushed stone into, um, you know, potentially even so, as far as the lake. So where on the plan was that roughly? Yeah, area? so there's no, it's not specified directly there. We, right. could, we could include that, but essentially it would be about, um, there's one about 100 feet from the, um, from the bridge, mm -hmm. and then another one probably about 50 feet beyond that, yeah. And what would the diameter be? 12-inch diameter. Yeah, these are really small uh, channels. Yeah. And again, the installation of that culvert would be not, you know, there's no, there's no active, like, we would never be working there in the, in the rain event when that would actually be running. So we would, uh, yeah, yeah. I have a weird little detail that I'm just, I, I just want to bring up. Yeah. So on the application, Eddie, you have that the owner is open space Institute right. Land Trust, right. and then on the short environmental form, you've got uh, Glenwood Center as the applicant or sponsor. 
does do we need to make sure that OS? I mean, this is like kind of a stupid question, I guess, but no, it's not. A it's question. you know, do we need to make sure that OSI knows that this is happening on their property, they, or yeah, is well, there a management agreement that could be attached so that we know that Glenwood can act on its own in terms of improvements? Right. I, that, I presume that's the case. I asked the same question. I said, you know, does OSI need to sign this, or can Glenwood's representative sign it? And and uh, you know, the, the, I pre presume there's something there. I don't know the answer to that, but. Um, and I do know, uh, we, you know, um, I have a relationship with, with OSI as well, and they're aware that it's going on, and there was a communication last week. So um, apparently with um, the Kathleen, the executive director, signing this, I assume that it was all straightened out, but, but that can be included. That, that, I'm just thinking, yeah. just for our yeah, own no, coverage, I, I we should have right. the, sure. yeah. the management agreement. Okay, so we need to schedule a site visit on this too. Okay. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank right. you. So before we go on to discussion of Chapter 175, I think you have a couple things to bring up. Yeah, the main, the main um, I think, point Andy was getting at was that there, uh, I don't know if the board recollects the um, property that's owned by uh, Deborah Needleman on Old Albany Post Road. Um, Greg Warner, the code enforcement officer, recently put a stop work order uh, on a um, installation or repair of a septic system, uh, a new septic system, um, on the south side of the property. Um, so I've contacted the um, their design professional, and they're aware of the situation. Their cons their uh, construction um, firm that was doing the work is aware of the situation, and they're going to be coming before the board essentially to present where they're at um, at the next meeting, I would assume. Um, I've allowed them to proceed to pump the septic tank and install any sort of temporary holding tanks that they may require um, in the interim. Uh, and I informed the design professional that more than likely the board would be requiring a, a PEAT system or something of the equivalent to be installed um, based on the precedent uh, uh, that other, you know, the board's made decisions on other properties in in, uh, um, in the last few months. So um, that's kind of where we're at with that. There was, uh, I believe that they have a repair permit from the county health department, but again, I they did not depict accurately the the wetland boundaries on the the um, surveys that they submitted to the county. So. Sans a, sans a uh, site visit by the county, I don't think anybody really would have seen seen this. So here we are. Yes. <laughs> so it was a total failure of the, their septic. Uh, I mean, that's what they were claiming, but you know, I I don't know. I don't full. I don't have the full story. I mean, again, they the initial conversation I had with the design design professional was. Can you allow us to proceed with this to get rid of a public health hazard? And I was like, well, on the other hand, you know, if you look at it from the other side, there's there's a public health hazard now. Yeah. We can find you. <laughs> so um, I we we went from there. Um, I don't really, you know, I'm not really sure. I mean, uh, I'm not I'm not sure of the history. I know that she was aware. I did do a delineation of the entire wetland on her property and. That flagging was not located on that survey that was sent to the health department. So, you know, it's not, I, I can't imagine she's unaware um, we of the situation. We dealt with the pool there recently. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, you know, that's where we're at. There was a little bit of history with the town highway supervisor and the town engineer. I believe that the health department requested that they pipe intermittent drainage that was coming off of Old Albany Post Road to the regulated wetland to allow them to obtain the repair permit. Um, and I, I, I think that without engaging our board or myself, they thought that, that was okay. And you know, that's kind of where we're standing now, so. I think we need to get that clarified because you know, I'm familiar with that section of the road. Right. Mm -hmm. And there, what's unusual on that section is it's A, it's flat. Yeah. B, there is a swale on the opposite side, yes. the east side. 
So I'm almost wondering if what the, at some point, what the town wanted is they were using that swale, where's the water going to go for it to work? And that's where I'm guessing there was probably a, co a small culvert that might have been flowing into the wetland, not the other way around. I think that does need to be clarified. Mm. Yeah, we can, we can, we'll get that clarification. We can look at the permit that they submitted to the health department, and I can talk to Ron. Yep. Anything else? Nothing yet. That would <laughs> no one needs to worry about. <laughs> yeah, it's all yeah, copacetic. Um, before we jump into 175, uh, when I was talking last month with Neil Zuckerman, the chair of the planning board, he had he wants us to look at the revised plans whenever they're given out for Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival and wants our input. So I'm just a heads up so everybody knows that. Okay. Okay. So what Jason had suggested is, as I think everybody knows, um, that the planning board did accept the final environmental impact statement for the Hudson Highland Reserve Conservation Subdivision. And uh, while our different memos sort of contesting it were, I believe, well received by the planning board. I think in the end, the planning board felt that they had no choice but to accept it as it is. So Jason had suggested that we begin to revisit it, and I believe, you could speak Jason too, that we'd like to get to a point where we actually have a, a workshop, public workshop, um, where perhaps it makes the most sense that the conservation board or maybe together with the planning board spearhead um, what should be tightened up in the law? What should be changed? So I wanted some thought on that. I don't know if everybody's had time to look at it's basically section 175, 20 and 21. It's not very long. Uh, Max and I had a brief discussion. Um, we thought two of the things that are definitely somewhat problematic is while there is a description of a conservation analysis, I don't think it's necessarily um, totally, I don't want to use the word practical, I, I don't think it's really delineating exactly what is needed. It's more in a, uh, I won't even say 5,000 foot view, it's more like a 20,000 foot view. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, just not to cut you off, Andy, but I mean, to speak to that, I think the, the, uh, I think the one, the one repetitive theme that has come up through this whole process is that it can't be a static picture if these projects are going to be drawn out over multiple years. So if there are, you know, questions that have come up by, you know, our board or the public that in terms of ecological understanding of the site that may be time you know better time seasonally those things should that that language should be built into the to the code to it to make sure those provisions are <coughs> adhered to um, so that we're not bound by a, a snapshot um, and at the so wrong time of year. Yeah, I mean, I, talking I, I, about just, of a, yeah. an evaluation of a project in advance. Right, thinking about how we, we, there was a lot of contention in this project regarding amphibians and, and timing on surveys that were done. Mm -hmm. And they did, they, they satisfied the code, but it wasn't at the optimal times, I, you know, and over X amount of years that the project going on. So that data collection could be going on, you know, in a more dynamic fashion. Real time. Real time, time. Yeah. yeah. Well, also, you mean things like you, when you do breeding bird surveys right. in the winter time, and you say, <laughs> yeah. well, there, there's right. nothing we have to worry about. There's no breeding right. birds there. Yeah. But while the existing <laughs> code, I'm going to use the word suggests it, I don't think it's fully mandatory in the sense that the site needs to be looked at as a whole needs to be looked at on the landscape or matrix level, everything around it, and essentially some type of assessment, even if it's a preliminary assessment, needs to be done first. And this is in the code, but I'm not sure it's described well enough, that 
That's done first before anybody is making any sketches and it's accepted by the planning board. I mean, we could say that we would like to be either an involved or also a, um, a, a partnered you know, agency with the planning board at that phase of it. I think another thing that we really need to look at is that yield calculation for ha and how that's derived because I have real problems with how that number is derived at this point. You know, the, that, the, the, the formula. Yes, right. As so, I mean. Formula, and the standards that go into the formula. Well, this, exactly, the standards and the formula. But, uh, you know, the other thing is, I, I don't think that anywhere when this was designed, and I know that, I mean, it was, it was really a new concept and it was kind of, you know, we want, they wanted to get it into the code, you know, but there right. wasn't a lot of mm -hmm. analysis and review and research on how to make it as tight as possible at the time that it was put in. So it was a valiant effort, but I think now we know a lot more than we did then, yeah. and we have practical experience. Um, and I really do think that we need to think of what is the objective for us to have a conservation subdivision as a category of development here because if we're just doing it as a basis for a developer to be able to get a higher yield of of units in on a development then that's not a conservation subdivision that's you know right. that, that that's a completely different thing you know right. see i was staying away from the density calculation because i just found it overly confusing but what you gave clarity to me is, and it's, it's stated a little bit, but not enough, is that there's a lot of land that should not be. Exactly. Because, for instance, you know, not only in our town, but in New York State, class three slopes on the whole you can't build on. Right. That shouldn't be in it. You know, wetlands, can't build on it, and buffers shouldn't be part of the calculation. And I think perhaps one of the problems is it's a separate section, the calculation, versus um, I guess it's the analysis because they really go hand in hand. Yeah. So you need to have a baseline analysis before anybody draws up a, a single plan on a blueprint. Right. Sort of a, the first step is required to be X. This is not a suggestion from the town. This is the town rule. Right. And maybe that, you know, I mean, yeah, and, and it, maybe it comes to the Conservation Board for evaluation once it meets that level of analysis. We look at it and then we pass it to the Planning, the planning Board yep. as a, we, you know, like, okay, this is a, a candidate for a conservation subdivision. This property is a candidate. I would, I would also suggest with, if that mechanism gets adopted, that what you're talking about, that they are they are required to submit a certain level of escrow to the town so that our professionals can look at, look at it, evaluate it, or we can retain a professional to look at it and, and, and evaluate it and then report back to this board. Um, because I think without that and that level of, of like having the, ha letting the board have that level of uh, understanding, um, from our own perspective, I think we're going to be behind the eight ball again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a peer review. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's absolutely. absolutely. I think that's a great Jason, idea. were you about to say something? Yeah, I was just going to add that. I, mean, I think this, this conversation, Andy and I had a conversation. I know the Conservation Board has been discussing it. The Conservation Board sent a memo to the Planning Board with their thoughts on the Hudson Highlands Reserve Project. And I think part of that was the idea that is is this conservation subdivision in practice living up to the spirit of what it was supposed to do? Um, and this has been the first test case and it has set a precedent. And I think the advice we've gotten is if the letter of the law is not living up to the spirit or the, the main intent of the conservation subdivision as a tool, then you should go back and look at the letter of the law and see if it can be tightened. 
And so, you know, I think it's a very, you know, a relevant thing for the conservation board to do because it's the board that has the most expertise in these sorts of matters. Um, and there is a, a bonus being given to developers in return for gaining conservation value. So I think it makes a lot of sense. I still have questions about, you know, what is the jurisdiction of the conservation board to weigh in like this? I, I think they should. I just don't know the answer to that. And was the conservation board involved in the crafting of the, the code around conservation subdivisions originally? But I, I do very much think that um, because this pr major project set a precedent and because there's the feeling that um, the spirit of the conservation subdivision is not being met, then it makes sense to go back and look at it before another large project comes along. And so um, this would spark that conversation if the conservation board, you know, wanted to wanted to bring bring that forward. So, Jason, understanding that the application that is before the planning board right now is pretty much a, a done deal, right? Yes. So is it possible for the town board to consider a moratorium on conservation subdivisions until such time as you know the conservation board and the planning board have time to evaluate and review and possibly tighten up the existing code I mean, I think that's a question, obviously, I would bring back to Supervisor Van Tassel and the town attorney and ask that question of what are, if the conservation board and maybe the planning board was going to undertake this sort of a review and comment on the existing code, um, could that sort of moratorium be put in place? I would ask advice from, from, and, you know. And if it's permissible, under the rules or statutes, I would highly recommend a moratorium because I think we have clear and convincing evidence that the letter of the existing law can be, can be applied in a way that does not achieve the spirit that underpin the original purpose. So we know the current language is ineffective and not what the, doesn't achieve the result the town wanted. And I think that sort of cries out for a moratorium if the town agrees. Jason, I mean, there's a lot of expertise here and a lot of experience, but what about bringing in some type of consultant as well? I mean, obviously, we didn't get it right the first time. I don't know who was involved in that or if we had a consultant or not, but it's such an you know, important area that maybe there's some external counsel or you know, experts we could bring in as well. Yeah, that's, that's just yeah. that's important. Because we seem to be in agreement with the town that the intent is clear, that that's not open for debate. The, the question is the letter of the law, and that's not really, well, certainly not my, my area of expertise, but you're right, that's where a consultant comes in. So if, if the conservation board, you know, if, if that's the feeling, I think I would take this back. Um, I would report back on this conversation to the rest of the board, Supervisor Van Tassel. Um, I could ask that question to the town attorney, uh, attorney you know, would a moratorium be put in place um, for this sort of review and report back to you all um, to figure out how to move forward into some sort of a, a public workshop or conversation about, about what we're at, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law and how, how they can be made closer. Um, what, what about a letter to, the, to the, the board, the planning board, about suggesting a moratorium? from us well I think I think that's the the it's duty the of the board. town board it's the town board yeah yeah it's the town board the other thing that wasn't mentioned too is what also needs to be tightened up is if if the con the conservation easement needs to be by an accredited land trust that's in the code no it's a land trust it doesn't it's not a, the word accredited because oh, it doesn't say accredited it, it says exist. a qualified yeah it didn't exist at the time it says a qualified. But what's qualified? Yeah, qualified these days, particularly if you look at what's being done with land out west, a developer could set up a land trust. But now, um, what is it, the Alliance, National Alliance LTA, of Land? Yeah, land I mean, trust they have Alliance. an accreditation program. Yes. So, I mean, that should be put in the law as well. That actually was in existence when this law was put well, together. 
Jason, that's a great. Would be able to ask to see if there's funding or a budget for a consultant, if possible. Yes, I'll be asked that. I'm guessing probably. Well, yeah. So I, I'll oh, ask that. It's not in the budget currently. I'm doing oh. budgets at work, so it's in my mind. So. <laughs> I, I do know it's not in the budget currently, um, but I, I, I can ask. But I, I guess uh, up to the Conservation Board to decide if it makes sense to have a letter from the Conservation Board um, uh, explaining why uh, the Conservation Board wants to kind of open up this conversation, uh, you know, putting forward the idea of a moratorium or investigating the potential for a moratorium, that is something that I could then bring back to the town board and report on. I mean, I will also ask these questions as well, but I, I just put that as consideration if, if the Conservation Board want to make that formal request to the town board that I would carry back. Does it make sense for us to put together a letter? I, I think it does. Well, and then CC the Neil Zuckerman, the planning board chair, would, on would this you, as well. Do you, do you all would, I mean, would your board like to hold that special, that special meeting prior to the letter? That way we can really think out and talk, discuss publicly the, our thoughts and, and I mean, we, we, we laid out, you, you all laid out some very important points here. I don't want that to get lost, you know? I would say that that putting together a letter to the town board stating kind of what we discussed here and saying that a piece of, of this, of the process going forward, is A, a moratorium until further review and analysis occurs. B, we, want, we would like to have a, a public workshop to further discuss this and get community input. And C, we'd like to think about um, possibly hiring a, you know, uh, an expert consultant to assist the town. Yeah. It yeah, just gets the ball rolling, sense. right? Okay. And we yeah, can we can do, we can take these tracks, you know, kind of in a parallel way. Makes sense. Do you want to do the draft memo? <laughs> <laughs> You're such a good writer, Andy. <laughs> I can pull something together. You just, if you'll pull, you know you'll shine it up for me. Is send, it? send me some bullet points. Okay. All right. All right. And then I'll, I'll, okay. uh, I'll All polish right. from there. But I think that have makes. To the, always do it. I think that makes the most sense. Okay. Just get it in the record. So, I think that'll be great. Okay. We have any other business? Can I ask a question? Absolutely. In regard to this. Last topic. Uh, are you thinking that you maybe need to define some things in the zoning code better? For instance, I noticed that conservation subdivisions generally cluster buildings in a relatively small area to have, you know, open land behind them. But the Horton Road project, I haven't looked at their FEIS in detail, but it looks like each house is still like on one acre with its own driveway and, you know, kind of spread out in a big oval around the site. And so the question arises, is that, is that a, you know, a cluster subdivision and more to the point perhaps, should, you know, should clustering be part of a conservation subdivision or not? And how do you define it if it is, if you decide that it is? According to the planning board, the, the, that, development that you're talking about seems to have met the criteria of our existing conservation subdivision right, code. The current code doesn't spell out what defines in terms of, you know, location of buildings, et cetera, what a conservation subdivision is or what cluster it is. I think that's why we're talking about letter and spirit here and where we want them to get unified in, in possibly in a, in a tuning up of the of the code. So that's something that Hold the thought could you go to the mic so Oh, yeah. Did you just go to the mic? Oh, no, I think I finished. But <laughs> 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 okay. We're get, we're getting used to this. <laughs> Did that answer your question, Liz? Yeah, because okay. that's people have asked me, aren't they supposed to, you know, line houses right. up closer together? Well, I mean, what I would see, right? That, I That's the principle yeah. of conservation right. subdivisions. I, I don't typically. know what's available online, but uh, sort of the, uh, 
I don't know if I want to call it the father or mother of conservation subdivisions was Randall Ardet. And uh, it's de I don't know what's available online. It, it's worth reading some of his material. But there's even newer sources, yeah. I think, you know, that, ha that, that have taken that forward. So. Okay. So I guess it's time. Do I? To set the site visits. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> This is why we don't do this at the end of the meeting, because it's like, <laughs> can we just go home? So, I mean, in, th uh, in theory, I, I think right now we're waiting on Manitoba. Right. But we definitely have Glenwood, and Banker should be looked at. It's no longer Banker. Yes, I apologize. <laughs> King's Dock. It is Stesma and Prince. Yeah. So there was, uh, Cheryl made an, I think, an excellent suggestion that maybe we pull to get, is it possible for us to have a date, a, a regular date once a month or twice a month or something like that where we do site visits yeah, and it's sense. just a regular date that I can stick in my calendar so I know not to schedule anything I else. think that's a terrific idea. Yeah. So that was Cheryl's idea. Yeah, that standing meetings will help. But the plan, just to give an example, they do a Sunday only. So it's not always the same Sunday as a month, but it's always a Sunday. So, mm -hmm. I mean, question what works better for people uh, a weekend day or a weekday? Yeah, I mean, both to me is possible if I can work it out. Like the Last visit um, to the recent uh, site visit, that I had a meeting just, I had to go to. It just popped in my calendar, you know, like that morning or that, that Sunday night, and that was it, you know. So so that's going to happen sometimes during the week. Obviously, they can't do that on the weekend, although sometimes they do. <laughs> but, you know, so less likely or family event or whatever. So if we had some standing meetings, like planned, like maybe one day on the weekend, one day during the week, and then decided or something like that, maybe that's an alternative. Or how does everybody feel about like Friday mornings, something like that? I mean, can we? The afternoons are usually better in my schedule. Yeah. Afternoons are better. Because I work okay. with Europe or you know other places okay. a lot, so the morning gets booked up. But at, at the risk of taking an unpopular position, although I cherish my weekends, <laughs> I'm generally much more available. I can be confident being available on the weekends. And I can't be confident of being available on a Friday morning or a Tuesday afternoon. Because if I have a, a board meeting or a committee meeting on, for some other project or group I'm involved with, uh, it's just, it, it's hard to, ch to change that. Whereas if every Sunday morning or some other weekend time, we knew that was going to be the site visit. That's easier for me, but if that doesn't work for the majority of the board, then let's pick a date during the week that works for the most people, and we'll do our best to be there. Sunday mornings could sometimes work as well, Saturday mornings as well. Yeah, I mean, to me, I, I have no problem with the weekend as long as we do it early. Yeah, early, early is yeah. you know, very preferable. The better, you know, on the weekend. I, c I can do weekend. I just, if we have it set, then I, it just sits in my calendar and I'm, yes. I'll am i be available. Otherwise, it's yes. like things just pop up, so. I mean, if I'm in Philadelphia visiting my grandchildren, I won't be there. That's <laughs> right. But I mean, I think, I'm on vacation. Right, we're not going to get everybody there, but I think the goal is if we could get a quorum yes. at minimum there, we'd be in much better shape. We, so yeah, The board used to do the, the, the morning of the meeting. Right. Right. Yeah. But we get into the weekday. That's the weekday thing. I, I mean, I'm going to suggest that we do it um, either the, the Saturday or Sunday before the meeting or two weeks before the meeting. So set those two Saturday mornings as like holds yeah, possibly. on our calendars. Yeah. Does that and make then you sense? can work with land, landowners and we can say this or this. Let's try it. Yeah. yeah. So let's try All that. Right. So, I mean, what we have pending right now is Glenwood and Kingsdock Road. 
Um, we are going to have to look at Manitoba, but that's going to be a whenever. Right. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Sure, you're good with that? Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Well, I think it's about that time. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you.